Um, the sell side, simplistically, are the, are the investment banks that everybody in there has probably heard of. So Goldman Sachs, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank, J.P. Morgan, et cetera. And the buy side is typically where the capital is uh, held and, uh, and the side that typically does the investing. And so if you think about the role of the markets in general in an economy, the purpose is to allocate the capital to where it's most needed. And so in general, the reasons why we have markets are for these enterprises that need a lot of money to pull the capital to diversify their risk. The sell side, simplistically, is who is selling the business. And they're selling it to the buy side. The buy side goes out and gets money from investors, investor investors into the market, which are composed, in general, comprised of businesses that the sell side is, is selling to more or less. The sell side also then serves role in, in making the markets and providing liquidity. Um, there's a lot more nuances and a lot more differences in the act. Uh, but in general, I knew that I wanted to be on the buy side. I wanted to try to be the first to participate in the investment banking side. Which, I went away. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what happened to you. Oh, yeah. We must have been getting boring. <laughs> so, uh, and coming, coming out of college, that's where I had my first uh, example tech bubble. And I had an offer to go work in New York City at, at Goldman Sachs. And I had worked my tail off to try to get that job. And then the tech bubble happened, and they rescinded my offer, and I was really disappointed. And it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me, which I think, in general, is the way things seem to work. Um, and I took a firm at an investment, a job at an investment consulting firm called Cambridge Associates, which, ironically enough, is based up here in Boston, Massachusetts, but I was in the Washington, D.C. office. And Cambridge Associates provides investment consulting to institutional clients. So I, I mean, these are, they were best known for essentially helping manage the endowments of large institutions such as Harvard, Yale, Princeton, uh, the, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, the Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund, really, really massive pools of money, billions and billions and sometimes hundreds of billions. And they provided lots of asset allocation so today I spend a lot of my time really thinking about should I buy X stock or Y stock, whereas at, at Cambridge Associates they spend a lot of their time on asset allocation. So should you invest in public equity or private equity or venture capital or hedge fund stocks? But the best part about the job was I worked in their research tool, and I actually got to work for the founder of the firm. And when I showed up, he said, well, for the next year, all I want you to do is read. And then he gave me these piles of books and piles of research papers. And for the next 18 months, I read and I read and I read. And I was writing paragraphs about essentially trying to summarize a book in a couple of sittings. And it was all investment history, investment philosophy, investment process. And in general, in my life, I've learned most of what I've learned outside of school, largely just through reading and writing on my own. The nice thing about this job as well is it gave me the opportunity to continue investing sort of outside of work. Um, and I started doing a lot in, in student housing and self-storage. And I actually bought some student property with the initial students of Southern there around in, in Appleton College, but also mainly around Charlottesville and University of Virginia and Harrison Bailey at Southern Miss. But still, I didn't have my job on the buy side, which was knew what I wanted to do. And, and so I went to business school. And I went up and uh, I really, I wanted to look for schools where I thought I could get a job on the buy side. And in general, the buy side is predominantly located in New York, Boston, London, and Hong Kong. And I sort of have an aversion to the massive and big cities, so I went to the country. And because uh, I didn't want to be in New York. And so I chose Dartmouth. I also chose Dartmouth because my wife, who I uh, who got married right before I went to school, we, she was from North Carolina. And we figured we'd be living in in Tennessee or North Carolina for the rest of our lives. And uh, we figured it'd be a decent chance to go up north for a while. Um, little did we know we'd stay up here. Um, so I go to business school and immediately found a bunch of fantastic people with a fantastic experience. Um, but while I was there, uh, I found another a friend who wanted to do something entrepreneurial. And 
not been doing these businesses in different ways off and on, and so we decided to start a company. And we didn't really have any idea what company to do, and so we explored lots of opportunities. We were from San Francisco, and we ended up starting a company called AT Dynamics. Um, I put a picture on there. I don't know if you can see it, but it's these aerodynamic devices that are attached to the back of tractor trailers, and they improve the fuel efficiency of truck fuel. Um, we like to say now that we save more fuel than we put in the freeway. <laughs> the company uh, was just moved to town to meet this problem. San Francisco just had to move a few months ago. So while I was in business school thinking that I wanted to get a job investing, we started this company. It's not more than just a company to do. We didn't really think we could do much. We were just going in there. But we won a couple uh, national and actually global business plan competitions, which gave us some financing. And then we went through the whole venture capital uh, financing round. And then all of a sudden, we were a real company. And more importantly, we had investors. We had real expectations. And, and uh, we had to start figuring out what we were going to really do. And so I stayed involved with that for the year, or roughly a year after business school, building the team out. And uh, it, all, the whole time, though, I really it really drove home to me that my true love was actually making the investments. And I, I like the, the more the idea stage, the building the mosaic as to why an investment might work or might not work, and the actual day-to-day -day operations, while I enjoyed them, they weren't as fulfilling to me. And so at that point, I decided to pursue the job, actually becoming an investor. I stayed on the board at this company and sell him today to let him take the company his way. So why do I love investing? You know, I, I think it, some people like to say, and this is probably giving it uh, too much credit, that investing is one of the last liberal arts. Um, in college, I was an economics major, and a philosophy and religion minor, which is a very fascinating uh, course of study, especially for an adjunct studying religion at a state college. Um, but I think investing is one of the few jobs where psychology, economics, accounting, you know, pull everything together and really build a full mosaic. I'm not sure if you can see uh, up on the screen, but this mosaic of, of, of the cheeseburger is actually comprised of all various different types of junk food. <laughs> you know, this is a stag. Um, and that's really what investing is. And I like to think that it's, you really try to think about how the world's going to change, who's going to play a role. What are those players going to need? And where is the capital most scarce? Where can we allocate the capital to generate the highest return? And it's really the formal part is thinking about how the world's going to change and the factors and dynamics that are, are going to affect it that intrigue me the most. And that's where my interest really lies. So I was really fortunate to get a job at a firm here in Boston called Wellington Management. Uh, it's... Uh, we're a private firm, and we purposely try to not have much of a public profile. Uh, we're probably best known for we manage many of the mutual funds of, of Vanguard. Some people have heard of Vanguard in the mutual fund world. We're predominantly a long-only investor shop, and what that means is that, in general, most of the funds that we manage here are long investment funds. Mutual funds that many of you can invest in, or other funds for institutional clients, both equity and fixed income. And then we have a smaller hedge fund team. Um, and that's where I'm focused. I manage uh, one of the hedge funds, we have 10. And, uh, and my focus is, is really on what I call capital structures, what I'll get into in a minute. But when I first came here, I was focused on one segment of the market, which is metals and mines. And I still do a lot of in that today. And this was the perfect, the perfect area to really <coughs> be thrown into the fire in regards to how difficult investing and really how difficult global investing can become. The two pictures that I see on here are just sort of representative of what I would call fantastic case studies. The picture of me standing in a piece of pile of dirt or in the grass uh, was in Mozambique. And uh, it was at a, what was supposed to be a coal mine with about 500 kilometers from a port in Mozambique. And the coal mine is one of the best coal assets in the world. Really high grade, um, really cheap to mine. And uh, everybody, sort of all the big global major mining companies, were looking to 
to acquire this asset. And uh, to hold this was called part of the mine, it was the infrastructure. So it was 500 miles inland, and it had to get to a port, and then it was to pull out. And the company was going around the world. It was an Australian listed company that owned the rights to the asset in Mozambique. And they were going around the world with presentations so showing their nice railway and all the bridges they had built that they could pull from the asset to the port. And if they had that, it was a really big piece that they had accomplished. And so before we made an investment, I thought it might be worthwhile to try to go and check it out. And when we arrived, this was the railway. <coughs> and long story short, it was a complete fraud. They had been showing pictures. It was a $3 billion company at the time, had investors all around the world. Um, but they had completely photoshopped the railway. This was an old railway bed came to visit you, when they came to visit us in Boston, they had just put little rail, pictures of rails, and made it look real in these pictures, and that's how they were going to ship the coal. So we obviously didn't make the long investment, and uh, we had, in this case, we actually shorted the stock, and it ended up being a good investment. This picture on the left is a brand new dump truck at a copper mine in Zambia, which is where a lot of the, well, the, the area in northern And uh, as China was urbanizing from 2000 till now, if you will, obviously copper prices went up a lot, and so that attracted a lot of capital into copper. And uh, whenever things are going well, people generally make a lot of bad investments, which is sort of how I ended up today. But this time, this company spent had spent $3 billion building a new mine. It was a really difficult decision for companies to think about because this asset is a 30-year asset. So when they're deciding how much money to spend and if they should do it or not, they have to make what I would call guesses, they would call them forecasts, about what the copper price will be five years from now, 10 years from now, 30 years from now, what will the exchange rates be, the cost of oil, et cetera, all things which I think are safely unknowable. But they went ahead and made the decision and spent $3 billion to build this mine. A year or two later, copper prices are kept going up, and a company called Barrick Gold Corporation, which many companies have heard of, at the time was the largest gold company, bought the asset for roughly $8 billion. Um, because they thought copper prices would stay high forever. A few weeks ago, the foreign minister, or the mines minister in the current election in Zambia, came out and said they're going to raise taxes on the mines. As a result, Barrett Gold is now closing the entire mine. The mine was built in 2007. It's been running since then. It's never really made any money. Now they're saying they're going to raise taxes. They have $3 billion of invested capital. They have some, a company that issued $8 billion worth of debt to do a takeover. And now the asset's going to be closed for a certain period of time. And I, these are just examples that I point out because they're extreme versions of how difficult investing can be when you put a lot of weight in sort of what you think the future is going to look like. In general, forecasting is impossible, and uh, it's best to make investments, in my opinion, when you don't when you have to don't have to forecast much. <coughs> so I, over the years, have developed a philosophy of investment. I call it capital thesis, and I try to, in general, it's a contrarian. makes others uncomfortable. It's a basic idea that that's where people are the most uncomfortable is where the greatest misfortunes might be. To do that, I focus on segments of the economy, you know, sectors of the economy or geographies or countries where capital is less, but where you can make a reasonable assumption that capital could exist, where there needs to be continued investment over the long run. I think energy is a great example right now. The recent decline in energy prices is the fourth or fifth biggest ever. If, if, if we don't have a recession, it will, only be, it will be the second time ever where oil prices have declined by 50% or more and it hasn't been associated with a recession. And as a result, every energy company in the, in the world is spending less, laying people off, firing people.
investment needs to continue and it's just setting up to make for a great investment opportunity in the future. Greece was in the news recently, yesterday with an election. Capital has been fleeing Greece now for several years. European cyclical, so this is segments of the economy. In, in Europe, unlike the U.S., uh, it, they've really been in a recession, arguably, since 2008. A lot of construction measures and activities are at early 1990 levels. Really, how I say we're how fortunate we are to live in such a dynamic economy. Um, but you can imagine if you were running a company in a world with such anemic levels of activity, you wouldn't be making much investment. The other key thing I try to do is I try to focus on assets that are really working hard for us that have some form of natural monopoly. With the basic idea being, if you think about the um, assets I just described in Africa, if you have something that's really difficult to replicate, the idea that you can be made obsolete is much lower. It's very difficult to replace. And so these are assets such as electric grids. I think the best example is a hydroelectric, hydroelectric dam. No matter how much money that electric plant makes, it's going to be really difficult for someone to come in and build a new one right next to it. I mean, clearly, the, the best investments are for the companies that have characteristics of both. I apologize if this is really difficult to, to read. It's, it's not the way forward. But this is where I highlight sort of what I look for. So the, the, the circle on the left are these segments of the economy where capital comes in and out really quickly. So when things are good, like housing and banking, people invest as much as they can. I mean, Tennessee and Chattanooga is probably one of the best examples of a boom-bust uh, real estate market, Texas, because it's really cheap um, to, to build and to buy, and land isn't very expensive. And so when, so when housing prices are going up, it's really easy for developers to overbuild. And then when prices start falling, generally they, they use a lot of debt. Prices collapse a lot. There's a lot of bankruptcy. In general, you, in our, my team at least, uh, we try to go into a market after there's been bankruptcy, after there's been a lot of pain and a lot of stress. And on the right, it's these more uh, what I call enduring assets. They're really difficult to replicate otherwise. So one of our largest investments is uh, Guangdong Investments, the Hong Kong Water Utility. And quite simply, there's a big pipe that goes from mainland China into Hong Kong, and it carries all the fresh water for the city of Hong Kong. And the nice thing about that is that you're not going to make a lot of money in that investment, but that investment is a necessity. So the idea that it could be replicated, or to this housing example, the idea that someone could come in and build way too many pipes is next to impossible. Um, and this will, I think, here I'm just going to walk through and sort of make a couple of uh, general statements that, that I think are just supposed to shed color on how I think about investing. I think in general, in the public markets especially, because in the public markets, your, your investments are often marked to market on a daily basis. And so when things are going good, they can easily be worth way more than they are intrinsically. And then the worst is when things are going bad, people just feel that. They get scared in their shells and it causes their price to just go down a lot. And while it's a great opportunity, it causes a lot of pain, stress, and anxiety. We always like to say that investing well requires being uncomfortable nearly all the time. If you're investing in something and it still feels really good, there's a very high probability that the value is already recognized in the price. And it keeps jumping in at the end of the game and it feels good and so therefore your risks are a lot higher. And so therefore I try to focus on segments of the market where there's actually been a lot of discomfort. Because to me, the discomfort is what creates the mispricing. In general, I think the mispricings are often uh, just a reflection of our own psychological bias. So I say here that it's confirmation bias, where we just look for things to confirm our own beliefs. We really don't spend much time trying to uh, disprove our beliefs. And that's sort of one of my biggest rules when reading, is I try to only read things that go against my bias, that go against what I believe. The way we frame things to our own worldview, the hindsight bias, which is where we expect things to, to just happen, to be more probable or more frequent in the future. And then the, the sort of, if you guys have taken psychology classes, you're familiar with the loss aversion, which 
is people are much more scared of losing a dollar than they, they get much more pain out of losing a dollar than they do joy out of making two. So therefore, people will do extreme things to avoid loss. In the public markets, you can imagine if you have a stock going down, it really hurts a lot. So even if you know you shouldn't sell, you just want to end the pain in yourself. Uh, I think a great example as a sort of a background for anybody in any form of business, be it marketing, management, what have you. The book Thinking Fast and Slow by Cannon is an influence by Dale Bean, which really gets to a lot of these psychological biases because they really affect whether it's managing your team or making investments or making decisions about the business you're running. It's really difficult to make good decisions. And then in my fund and in my philosophy and process, I essentially say, I have no interest saying I'm going to fall prey to these same biases as well. And therefore, I need to have a structure that sort of assumes I'm going to make those mistakes. And therefore, I need to make sure I can have some things on my side. So in each investment, I want to think that I either know the company better than most, the company is highly liquid, or better yet, I'm providing liquidity when other people are pulling out liquidity, or the asset's very scarce. I mentioned. And this is just a business cycle chart that I think is a simplistic way to, to highlight what I look to invest in. And you can sort of go following capacity being closed and bankruptcies. And after the bankruptcies, when capital is left and people are starting to consolidate and returns are just starting to get better, that's when you can make the most money with the least amount of risk. The probability that things can get really bad at that point is really low. Once you move to sort of the best part of the business cycle, when a lot of money is coming in, when you're reading about how good things are on the front of newspapers, when you're reading about how all your friends or your colleagues are making a lot of money in the tech world, or right now you could argue biotech, that's when you really have a lot of risk. It doesn't mean things can't keep getting better, but it means if something changes, prices could fall a lot. And those are just areas that I try to avoid. And it's uh, all these things are much easier said than done. One of the things I've been most fortunate in in life um, is, is knowing what I enjoy from a work perspective. I've always loved investing. And this really didn't become clear to me until business school. When I was in business school with a bunch of really smart people all who were super motivated, who had been extremely successful in their jobs out of undergrad. And they came to business school, and the interesting thing about business school is you had all these fantastic firms, McKinsey, Goldman Sachs, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, GE, they would come to campus and they would recruit and offer great jobs with signing bonuses and these some sort of programs. So it was really easy for people just to say, I'm gonna go take this job. Um, but they had never really thought what am I going to do with this job? Who are the people going to be that I'm going to be working with? What, my, what will my job look like and my career look like in three or four years? They had never really taken time to say, what do I want to do? How do I want to spend my day? So it's really difficult questions to answer. And it was probably best driven home to me um, with my wife. And she essentially did, she, they were telling me what I was doing now, but she did exactly what I did. She worked at another firm here in Boston called Bain Capital. We've got people who got to know about it during the last presidential election because Mitt Romney helped found it. Um, but she really didn't enjoy it at all. She always would ask me, why, did I, why do I enjoy investing? She just happened to be smart and good at what she does. And she's a really thoughtful person. And even to this day, she knows she loves our children, she loves our family, she loves being home with our kids. But she actually doesn't really know what she would like to do for a job. And part of the reason I think that is is because there's so many options. And that's really a new phenomenon sort of in our civilized existence. And I think these charts up here sort of is just a simple way to, to think about it. Throughout most of history, um, you had one of two jobs. You were either a soldier or a farmer. And then during the Middle Ages, as technology sort of came about, there started to be a few different jobs started building things. There were some tradesmen. Um, farming got a little bit less important and started, capital started to be developed. So there were forms of levers. 
But there were sort of still kings, and they had all the power. There weren't much of the economy that we know about today. So once the war came around, everybody that had a job was either going to go back and be a farmer employee. So you really didn't have much options. And, and this really started to change in the last hundred years. So these little blue dots, or the little yellow dots, if you will, um, really in the Industrial Revolution, when capitalism really started compounding. We'll get into more of that in a little bit. Started really just opening up opportunity. And today, obviously, most people do something uh, different and unique. And each little, I don't know if you can see the honeycombs in the yellow portion of that, represent a unique and specific job, but they're still really a big generality. So what I do, I mean, my title is a portfolio manager. Um, it's called a financial analyst. And that's roughly 2.3% of the U.S. global economy. But in my mind, what I do is completely different than what a financial analyst would do um, at Goldman Sachs. There is nothing about our day that is similar. Yet we would be classified as the same. In fact, here at Wellington today, we have 14 job openings that would all fall under financial analysts. And every one of those jobs by how you or I would think about it is completely different. So that's just a long way of saying it's really difficult to choose uh, what you want to do. And so I always tell people when you're in school, there's probably nothing you can spend more time thinking about sort of the self-reflection of what are the things that I really enjoy. It's such a difficult thing, given how many options. Um, so the next few slides and thoughts are really just uh, things that I found useful in sort of thinking about uh, careers and investing. Um, this idea of compounding is good. It's always good to put a picture of Einstein in any presentation. <laughs> and I always use as much help that I can get because I thought it's so original. Um, time goes by quickly. It's sort of one of the few things that we can know. We can't forecast what oil prices will be. We can't forecast what's going to surpass the iPhone or what's going to make Facebook obsolete, but we do know that time goes by. So never underestimate the power of little actions compound. This both in investments, so in general the best businesses are those that do little things and over and over and over versus businesses that do really big things. And then I think this is most true in our behaviors and decision making. Once you start habits, they're really difficult to break. In, in investing, sort of the best habits to engender is delayed gratification. Don't do what feels good that day. So when prices are collapsing, it's best to buy. When prices are rising, it's best to sell a little bit. But when you do the opposite, it compounds and it builds upon itself. These here are some uh, more thoughts from just way back or things that I think are important. So when I hire people, I typically go into these and sort of ask them their thoughts on these topics, if you will. Each year isn't very much, and this is a long or a short way of saying, really put a lot of thought into what are you learning this year. As you think about where you might go work, or as you think about what you might study, how is that going to affect you 10, 15, 20 years from now? When you think about taking a job, the one thing I've learned is it's much more important to really evaluate who, is, who are the people that you're going to be working with and spending time with. In my opinion, that is much more important. And do they care about you? Are they willing to be a mentor? Are they good people? Then actually the role you're going to take. So the only advice I would have is if you're considering a job, I would put much more weight on the person than the role. The role will evolve no matter where you are at it. Um, sort of in the world of big data and computers, we often want precision. And I think one of the biggest things I struggle with in hiring analysts when you build a model for a company and you say try to figure out what a company's worth, they come up with a number. And it's based on a P.E. ratio or an earnings number or a free cash flow number. But in general, they miss the big picture in an effort to find the precision. So really just trying to constantly develop mental models that can help you understand the big picture. And then the last statement here is to sort of always be cynical and never lose caution. In my job, we spend lots of time talking to CEOs of major corporations. And typically, the bigger the corporation, the better the sales. So if you're meeting with the CEO of, of GE, 
he's giving all of his time to missing other people with his loyalty. When he meets with the CEO of a small company that isn't publicly listed, they're spending all of their time running the thing. So it's always just important to know where people are coming from when you're trying to get a story. Um, he's here, I guess, uh, this idea of ambiguity in the business world, I think, is really important. Um, we never know much. And I think, you know, in general, I find that analyzing somebody's comfort with ambiguity is really difficult. So I always like to say, can you really understand both sides of an extreme view and sort of be the proponent for it in this eloquent way? So why is it stock to buy? Why is it stock to sell? And then feel comfortable understanding both. And then given that you can understand both, you've got to then go forward and make a decision. And that's clearly the difficult part. In finance, uh, it's awesome. People spend a lot of time talking about how much some people work. That was one thing my wife really didn't give a shit about. If you would show up at 7 and leave at 10 or 11, whether or not it was good for them or not, I'm pretty sure it was bad for them. Um, but I do know that when you're tired and unhealthy, it's really difficult to make good decisions under stress. And uh, one of the most important things for me is my health. And uh, so I always just encourage everyone that works for me and with me um, to put a high priority of exercise, eating well, and sleeping a lot. Because growing up as an Adventist, we're all really fortunate that health has been a bigger part of our lives for most of our lives. Um, that's not the same for all. And then this, this last is more just me. Um, but the only rule I have, it's interesting, you, uh, you interview so many of these ridiculously smart people on a resume, but the only rule I have is that I want to look at people over time, and no matter where you were or who you work with, I think it's really important to just make sure that you can always give time, and that they're kind, and that you're not put in a position that compromises the kindness. And I say that in finance because in some jobs and in some firms, it can be incredibly competitive, especially at the earliest levels. A lot of firms have up and out rules where they're going to hire 10 people and one year later there's only going to be five of them. That sort of environment is difficult for engaging with kindness. <laughs> and uh, in, in general, I think that you know life's too short to try to really put yourself in that situation. And I'll end with, I really like poetry. I think one of the uh, negatives of technology is this idea of short attention spans. I, I, I still read a lot of books, um, but I read less than I used to. And, uh, and especially as global market prices are changing almost 24 hours a day, and with iPhones and Blackberries and email, it's so easy to be just as distracted. I've gotten more and more into poetry, and I think part of it's because poems are always, always short. <laughs> or they can be short, so it's an easy way to get to a big idea. But I, I think this is sort of a nice one to sort of su summarize and best in, in sort of this idea that we're always learning. It just goes, when I was 19, I told a 30-year-old man what a fool I had been when I was 17. We were all of us, he said, glancing down, a fool two years ago. And uh, I know that's really been true of my life, and I think it's true of most people's lives. Um, this gentleman, Donald Hall, is an extrovert here in town. He's a great guy. He, he writes a bunch of short stories. I mean, actually, even my, our favorite children's book is a book he wrote. Uh, but he's, he's known for being a poet. So if you, if you ever want to get some poetry, it's probably worth a look. And I think I'll stop there and open it up to questions. Stephanie or Leon, but originally I get asked that a lot. I, 
and the theme to lead. Are you familiar with his work? He wrote, he's most known for the book Fooled by Randomness. Actually, he's probably now most known for the book uh, The Black Swan. People have heard about the term of Black Swan event. This is the, the statistic that the basic guy learns in the story of the Black Swan. That all swans were known to be white. And everyone sort of used to joke about the idea of the Black Swan. And then people went to Australia and they found there were Black Swans. This is something that was thought to be improbable, eventually happened. Um, and that's, that's where he came up with the title. So those are his most notable, most notable books. I actually have found his favorite to be um, anti-fragile. Just talking about the complex nature of systems. Um, but I'll send around a, a bigger list with a bunch of with a bunch of books. Um, I guess the, the maybe the other one would be uh, Will Durant's Lessons of History, and that's a it's a, it's a nine part series. He spent about fifty years writing it. It's essentially a history of the world, which is kind of unbelievable. Uh, but he wrote essentially an anthology at the end, about hundred and twenty pages. And I try to read it. Summarizes the the ninth, which is 50 years worth of work, more than that. and it's just a bunch of generalities. But I, it's easy to read and it's good. He's a good writer, so uh, he probably has a lot. Last fall, and you know the the depreciation of the euro, the Swiss francs depreciated about twenty five percent one day, just two weeks ago now. Put several funds out of business completely. Uh, the currency volatility that we've seen over the last six months has been relatively unprecedented. But keep in mind what central banks are doing by expanding their balance sheets is for sure unprecedented. Um, Europe's in a really difficult situation, and so essentially uh, Germany, by being the key power, has been able to force austerity on all the Mediterranean countries, um, which has given Germany a really low cost of capital, which is representative of their low bond usage. Um, and then they've been able to benefit by having a relatively weak currency, given their trading power, and by having the euro. They're obviously benefiting even more. Um, and this is creating a lot of weird political dynamics. And I think it's really being tested now, obviously, with Theresa winning in, in Greece. And then I think more importantly, the far left has just been ripping in holes in Spain. So it went from about a 5% majority to now they're right in line with the left and the right-wing parties in Spain. So it's a real threat that they could take over there. And the same is happening in Italy as well. And I think because of that, it's going to force Germany to be much more um, pragmatic when it comes to their negotiations with Greece. So my basic, it's in nobody's interest for the euro to break up. Um, there's going to be lots of maneuvering and politicking going on, some crazy things said. But our general bias, or my general bias, is that the euro will stay weak, that, um, and that Germany and Spain will stay in the euro, um, at least for the time being. I think ultimately, maybe it, it does break up. I mean, in general, most currency systems fail. It's just usually a, a 20 to 80 year event. The euro is really only better out in 15. 
between the 25 years, between the point how you want to define it. Um, and uh, that's sort of our bias, my bias right now. And then there's several things. It's, the QE in Europe actually is coming at a time when the business cycle is picking up in Europe. And so Europe could look a lot better for the next few months if all this political drama doesn't throw them off, off course, so to speak. Um, but then obviously, you know, to the to the black swan, to the black swan of the in the world with when we're even having these conversations, we shouldn't be surprised if a more extreme outcome happens. I mean, we, we've got to, we've got to be prepared for it. Um, I know that was, I, I didn't say anything too specific, but that probably gets to a lot of what I said. We don't really know that much. But, you know, in our fund today, we have a, a really large portion of our portfolio in Europe because it really fits those attributes of there being a lot of fear, uh, a lot of distrust. Um, things aren't good. Most people don't think things will get better for a lot of the reasons you highlighted. And in general, that's where good opportunities are found. And so every investment has lots of risk. That's why I, I put in there a statement, you know, investing well requires sort of constant discomfort. Because you know if you're comfortable, then you're in the late stages. When you don't have emotions. <laughs> so, hi, Keith. This is Stephanie Sheehan. How would you describe a good day at work? When you go home at the end of the day, what would have happened for you to say, man, this is a great day? I would have left at noon and <laughs> went to the library for breakfast. No. <laughs> um, well, that's actually. To me, what gets me really excited is is when we met, when we meet a company that we've never heard of before, and we can tell that it's misunderstood, and that management team is fully aligned with its investors, and uh, and you think you found your new investment opportunity, and so that would you come into the office. My typical day is I come into the office. Europe opens up. In the morning, so we're closing. That's where London sort of has the best time zones for our job because you can sort of work and have all the markets open at some point during your work day. And then, so come in and uh, essentially just become aware, read the news, and then try. In general, we either I try to meet with or have a call with a company management team a couple a couple times a week. Um, and then I probably spend uh, four to six weeks a year on the road visiting these companies at their homes. You always learn more about anybody when you visit their home. Um, and uh, and so that that's what gives you the potential to, to be uh, to, to have a great day. But the part of the work that I struggle with the most, and that you know makes me think I have bad days sometimes, are all the distractions. All the, we get so much research from the sell side. I mean, I, I think right now, on my email, I have 33,000 unread messages. And to delete, I have it set up to delete all my messages every two months. So that's 33,000 in the last two, and that's all just research. And the, the, the sell side sending in reports on all these different companies. I don't read them all, obviously, um, but you do sort of see them. And, uh, and then stock quotes changing really for your investor or for that, if they care. Um, and and uh, so what I really enjoy uh, trying to, to distract from, and when I can do that well, which is oftentimes not in the office, um, that's what I love. How, do, how, do, how can we read more? It's so difficult. I find it myself. I try 
try not to be I try not to be the scandal. Um, but then I but then I do. <laughs> can't say, I'm going to read five books this semester. But maybe what you can do is you can say, well, I'm going to spend ten minutes each day reading two to five pages of a book. And make sure you pick a good one. Because nothing will stop you reading the most reading is terrible book. Um, and then try to read a little bit more. And then the next month, try to read ten pages a day. Um, and then I, I think it's just really Technology. I, with knowledge, with, with, with information becoming ubiquitous, it's really with your ability to process the information and to make decisions with the information that separates you from history. You can bring up any topic, and you can each go pull up Wikipedia in one second, and we'll sort of have the information. But how we interpret the information is what you know we can sort of lead up to make different decisions. And the, to me, the things that can help you make decisions are lots of context that you get from reading and your ability to focus and hold ideas in your mind for long periods of time. Um, and I think reading helps you focus. So really try to do things like spend lots of time without your technology uh, to focus. I have a, a stepsister and brother-in-law who lives in San Francisco and has been in, in sort of the technology world since the early 90s. And it's always fascinating to me so now most people out there have these rules like when you go in your house, you put your phone in the back. There's no checking phones in your house. You know, a lot of people are getting rid of the internet in their house. So if you're going to get on the internet, you leave to go somewhere and be intentional in why you're leaving. And it's sort of, you know, those are more extreme examples, but really finding ways to get, get, to get yourself time to think away from sort of distractions. That's my biggest I really, I really struggle with the focusing. Thank you, Keith. We really appreciate you being a part of our class from afar. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you talk, your talking, Keith, and I wish you could be here, but I know that um, it's a, I think you made some good choices for you to be there. Thank you.